Okay, um, good afternoon everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to be invited to um, give you this presentation on immunology within the higher biology, um, human biology curriculum. Um, I thought I would start off today by just giving you a bit of background um, to who I am, um, what I do, um, talk then a bit about some aspects of immunology within the curriculum and how we can use immunology to understand disease processes and then as um, you've heard from Kate we will follow this up by some questions at the end. So, let's this. so my background, um, I have a BSc and PhD in immunology both from University of Glasgow and when I left Glasgow I became a research scientist at the Modern Research Institute um, liked it so much that I've stayed there ever since um, and I'm now a principal research scientist and I run a research group investigating immune responses and vaccine development in livestock and I do that um, in conjunction um, with collaborators um, around um, the world actually but um, principally I've got collaborations and funding um, with the universities of Edinburgh and Glasgow and I have an honorary professorship at both of those. Um, I'm also chair of the International Union of Immunological Society's Veterinary Immunology Committee um, because that's my principal area of veterinary um, research, veterinary immunology research. Um, and I'm also a member of the coordination group of the UK Veterinary Vaccinology Network, um, which is run under the auspices of the BBSRC. Um, so in terms of why I'm interested in doing this sort of thing, um, the organisations that I work with, the funders, um, the committees that I'm part of, we all have an interest in advancing um, scientific research but also education, outreach and undertaking knowledge exchange activities with multiple audiences and I've done work in the past with CERC and that has been really a, a great privilege to um, interact with um, school teachers and it actually helps me a lot in terms of my science, in terms of focusing um, and how we conduct these activities. Um, so um, as I go through this, um, one person I would like to thank is um, Madeline Clark from the Veterinary Vaccinology Network um, because she um, provided us with some of the images which I will be using throughout this presentation. So in terms of the higher human biology, um, I've looked through the curriculum and what I've highlighted here are some of the mandatory key course areas um, relating to immunology and public health. So we have under the immune system aspects of non-specific defences and specific cellular defences and then there is a section on infectious diseases and immunity looking at aspects of transmission and control of diseases, how to prevent them through immunisation and vaccination and also how infectious agents interact with the immune response um, and may evade um, immune responses. The area that I've chosen to focus on today is really within section 1b, the specific cellular defences, um, and this is really based on feedback that I've had from interactions with um, school teachers, mainly through CERC activities, and the areas that um, I've highlighted here in red that you can see um, are immune surveillance, the clonal selection theory, TNB lymphocytes and immunological memory. And these are all specifically mentioned within the curriculum. Um, what I'm going to try and do is deal with these in a collective manner, um, so I won't necessarily deal with them all individually. Um, hopefully you'll see as I go through this that they are interlinked um, and that understanding elements of, in particular, the clonal selection theory brings all of these components into play. So in terms of the clonal selection theory, um, you'll see this again in a couple of um, the slides here. What I've done is I've highlighted some text in italics. Um, this has been taken directly from um, the guidance for the school teachers. Um, and under the clonal selection theory, what we have are lymphocytes which have a single type of membrane receptor which is specific for one antigen. 
and the antigen binding leads to repeated lymphocyte division resulting in a clonal population of lymphocytes. So that's the stipulation and the guidance that um, is given for um, the teachers. In terms of understanding this, this theory, um, the importance really is that what it helps us to do is put into um, some sort of sense of understanding of our self-non-self discrimination about immunological tolerance, immune activation and also immunological memory. And what I hope at the end of this is that you will have a better understanding of all of these concepts because the practical applications for these in terms of health are that they help us understand responses to infection and to tumours, um, vaccination, transplantation and the development of immunotherapeutics. So these are all things that we use in terms of um, health management. So just to give you some background on the clonal selection theory, um, these are the scientists that are credited with the development of this theory, um, McFarlane Bur Burnett and um, Sir Peter Medower. And you can see here that they were awarded the Nobel Prize um, in Physiology and Medicine in 1960 for the discovery of immunological tolerance. And the theory that they came up with has been really crucial for our modern understanding of immunology. And what they stipulated within this theory was that lymphocytes will express receptors of a single antigenic specificity. Crucially, they also identified that this specificity would be genetically determined and therefore would precede antigen encounter. And that upon encountering antigen, you would only see stimulation of cells with receptors specific for that antigen and subsequent to that you would get clonal expansion of that lymphocyte population. And that's kind of highlighted here just in this diagram of two lymphocytes, slightly different colours um, and you can see the receptors on their surface. So these lymphocytes would respond to different antigens. I've put this statement at the bottom here. Um, it wasn't really part of the initial clonal selection theory, but it's an, an important component because of um, this point um, up here about the genetic um, determination of antigen recognition. And that is really because when we realise the diversity that we have in our antibodies and in our T-cell receptors, our genome cannot possibly encode for that um, range of diversity. We don't have the, you know, the, the capacity within our genes to, to encode for such diversity. So what we know now is that that diversity um, of those receptors is um, partially achieved through a process of what's called random gene rearrangement of all of the subcomponents that go to make up the genes that go to make up those receptors. And it's the RAG, the recombinase activation genes, and also a process of somatic mutation that gives us that diversity. So that's just an additional point in terms of um, the fact that the receptors are genetically determined. So if we look at what happens within this theory, or within this model, we have a, a progenitor bone marrow cell, um, lymphoid cell, which would give um, rise to a large number of early stage lymphocytes, each with different specificity. So this is where the genetic um, coding comes in. You can see that these lymphocytes are different and they've got um, different shaped receptors. As these cells develop, we have this process of gene rearrangement. Now, this gene rearrangement of the receptors is random. And because it's random, there is a danger that in rearranging these genes, what you will then get is lymphocytes that will make receptors that are specific for proteins that are our cells. So there needs to be some sort of process of controlling that. And what this theory um, then stipulated and has, has, has actually been proven is that what we have is a process whereby at this early stage of development, 
if these lymphocytes are stimulated and they get this strong signal from an antigen that their receptor binds to, um, this is going to be self-antigen because this is at a very early stage of development, um, then these cells are removed, um, they're deleted, so that you then don't have them developing any further. So what you end up with then is these cells here, which have been positively selected, and you get um, essentially um, this pool of lymphocytes, which do have antigen receptors, um, which are then ready um, to um, circulate around the body, and they act as immune surveillance, um, waiting for you to be infected or for them to encounter specific antigen. So upon exposure to antigen, what we would see, in this case, if this is the antigen here, then you see development or proliferation only of this cell type and not of this cell type. So hence, it's clonal. And all of these daughter cells will have receptors the same as the parent cell, hence um, clonal expansion. And these lymphocytes will form a population of what are known as effector cells. And their job is to eliminate the foreign antigen. But also what we know is that some of these cells will develop into long-lived memory cells. So they will then circulate around the body, a bit like we have in this case here, but the point that, to remember is that once you've had this clonal expansion, then you're going to have a larger number of those cells in terms of immune surveillance. And that's very important when we think about how this um, works in practice. Because this theory really underpins the formulation of a lot of immunological paradigms that relate to self-tolerance. So what you could see in that diagram is that you have deletion of cells at an early stage in development that may react to yourself and therefore um, you, you have tolerance to self-antigens. Um, but also what we see is the process of immunological memory and that can be used practically for things like vaccine design. So if we look at this chart, if you encounter antigen at this stage, then at this point in the process, what you would have had would have been, where I showed you in the diagram, that single cell, which is capable of responding. There is a lag period, now if we're looking at, in this case, um, antibody, there is a lag period when you don't really see much antibody in the blood after that antigen has been encountered. And what's happening at that stage is those cells are dividing, you're getting the clonal expansion, and then as they expand and produce more and more antibody, you'll see the antibody um, response appearing, and that's specific to antigen A in this case. So that's known as the primary immune response. That will, over time, decline. The antibody levels in the blood will, will drop. If you then encounter this antigen A again, and here, just for the purposes of showing you what happens in a complex situation, so with antigen A and antigen B, the response to antigen A is then much more rapid, so you can see there isn't the same lag period, and also it's much greater. So this is called the secondary immune response. And at this point, the reason that this happens, it's so accelerated and elevated, is that whereas you had single cells here um, capable of responding, here you have your memory cells and it's a larger population. So this is why we see this um, chart. Whereas if you compare it to antigen B, which is um, we've been exposed at the same time, what we're effectively seeing at this point is a response, a primary response to antigen B. So it looks like this here. So that really explains how the clonal selection model shows you how you get secondary immune responses. And in, therefore, um, you can see how this is very important for vaccines, because what you want with your vaccine is to essentially um, do this step here so that when you then get exposed to the infection, you respond in this very much quicker and um, more accelerated way, and that offers protection. 
So I mentioned immune surveillance, um, and there is specific reference to this, um, again, within the curriculum. So this is the text that you will see within the, 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 the guidance. Um, so it's a range of white blood cells that um, circulate, and these cells, it says monitoring the tissues, these cells, what lymphocytes do is they circulate between the tissues and the blood. So they're constantly going around the body, they'll go into your tissues, they go into the lymph fluid, then go back into the blood, and then they'll keep circulating. And that's the process by which they will provide immune surveillance, um, and they will become activated if tissues become damaged or invaded by infectious agents. Um, the cells then release cytokines, and I'm going to explain in a couple of slides what cytokines are. Um, but what they, what they will do is they will um, result in increased blood flow, which um, then results in more of these white blood cells accumulating at the site of infection or tissue damage. And in doing so, what that does is it then allows your immune system to fight the infection and um, provide you with protection. So if we think of the type of um, infectious agents that we might be exposed to, there's actually quite a wide range of these. So um, really putting these in order of size, we have viruses, um, fungi, bacteria, protozoa, and right up to very large organisms like parasitic worms. And because these are all very different organisms, the immune system needs to be able to discriminate between these and mount an appropriate immune response to protect us against disease. And if I can explain this just a little bit further, looking at these different types of infection, as I said, I've gone here from essentially the smallest um, to the largest. These organisms will infect us in different ways and they'll live in different parts of the body. So some of them will live inside cells, some live in body fluids, some of them will live in tissues. And to fight these different types of infections, particularly if they're inside cells, um, if you make a lot of antibody against an infection that's inside cells, that's really not going to do anything because the antibody can't get at it. So we need to have the right type of responses. And in that case, we would have our T cells. So this is where the difference between T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes comes into play. Um, but we need to know how those lymphocytes are controlled um, to respond in the most appropriate way. And this is where some of the complexities of adaptive immune responses come into play. Um, and what I'm going to try and do is explain that in as simple a way as I can um, with a diagram here. And this is about how we might make the right type of immune response. So when we are infected, we have cells that are called antigen presenting cells and the job of these cells is they're very part they're a very important part of that immune surveillance process I described for the white blood cells so um, these cells will take up antigen and what they will do is they will um, process and present that antigen to a T lymphocyte, and here this is I've called this a THP, so it's a precursor um, lymphocyte, a CD4. So that's a molecule that these lymphocytes have on their surface, um, and these are very particular types of T lymphocytes. What this cell will do is it won't only present antigen to that T cell for recognition by the T cell receptor, which I described earlier it will also produce cytokines. And the cytokines that this cell produces are very much dependent on the type of infection that it encounters. So this cell here is able to discriminate between some of those different types of infections. So what it sees are patterns. So essentially, it's the immune system saying you're infected with a virus or you're infected with a bacterium or you're infected with a parasitic worm. And what it will do is it will produce these cytokines that then instruct this T cell to develop. And the way that this T cell then develops, depending on these cytokines, it can become what's called a T helper 1, which 
is very good at fighting intracellular bacterial infections. So these are the types of cells we would see or hopefully see um, in people that are infected with things like um, mycobacteria tuberculosis. Um, T helper 2, which are very effective at fighting parasite infections, so intestinal nematodes, that sort of thing. Um, these are very effective at fighting that. T helper 17 cells, which um, are very good at fighting extracellular bacteria and also fungal infections. And then this other very important type of T cell, which is called a regulatory T cell. And these T cells are anti-inflammatory. And they're very important because so far all I've focused on is how we switch immune responses on. Actually, what's important is also to switch immune responses off because otherwise what you get is inflammation and a lot of tissue damage. So while these things are happening here, we also have these cells being stimulated and these are the cells that will control immune responses to stop your immune system damaging you in the process of trying to fight these different types of infections. And these different T cells make different types of cytokines in their own right. And what they can do is they influence the development of other types of cells. So for example, um, what we'll find is that they can influence the development of these cells called CD8. So they've got a different molecule on their surface from the CD4. And their job is to kill virus infected cells. So that's another very important arm of the immune response. And also what they will do is they will help B cells to make, so these are the B lymphocytes, to make lots of antibody. And what those antibodies will do is then they will recognize pathogens, so there can be a range of all of these, even viruses, because although viruses are inside cells, they've got to get outside of that cell to get into another one to infect it. And that's when they're vulnerable to antibody. So these cells are very important and the cytokines that they produce, hopefully what you can see here, are what can then dictate the type of immune response. So that's how we know, or that's how our body knows, to make the right type of immune response to fight particular types of infection. So that's just a very brief and quick run through of some of these aspects that have been highlighted in the, the um, Higher Human Biology um, CFE. Um, as I said at the start, hopefully what you've got now is a bit of a better understanding of immune surveillance, um, the clonal selection theory, what T and B lymphocytes are, what they do and how they relate to each other, and also how the clonal selection theory helps us to understand immunological memory. And although I haven't really explained um, or focused in on these aspects, what you can see is that they're not mutually exclusive because what I've described here um, also applies to aspects of infectious diseases and, and immunity. So to summarise what I've said, um, the clonal selection theory, and hopefully you can see that that's very central to underpinning our knowledge of immunological surveillance and also immunological memory, that our ability to respond to multiple antigens is genetically determined. So those receptors um, are in our genome and there has therefore to be very selective methods of stopping us responding to ourselves, which is um, explained by the clonal selection theory, that we are exposed to many different antigens from many different types of infections and that we therefore need different types of immune responses to control these. And what I've just given you here is um, a link to um, a welcome um, image. Um, it's the big picture um, and a hyperlink. Um, firstly, I would like to thank them for um, giving us permission to, to use their um, images, um, but also that's a resource um, that you can use and it's an excellent resource in terms of immunology. So I'd like to conclude there and um, hopefully that has stimulated um, some interest and I look forward to some discussion with you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Gary. Um, you've covered a very tricky area of the curriculum for us, and I'm sure that the teachers who are watching will have found it very 
helpful and informative. And I understand that there are some students um, watching as well, and I'm sure they will also have benefited from that and will be able to discuss these things further with their teachers. Um, so now Gary and Marjorie will discuss some questions that um, Marjorie um, has been thinking about as um, Gary has been talking to you. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks very much to Gary. And, and at the moment, um, Kate and Sean are going to be um, collating and collecting um, questions from the audience. But um, I'm going to start with a few of mine. Um, when you were talking about um, memory cells, it started to make me wonder about is if, if there's some kind of reason why T, some T and B lymphocytes survive as long-term memory cells and, and others don't. So there is a reason. We don't really know what that um, or what the mechanism for that is. So what you will see when the immune response is developed, I mentioned effector cells and I mentioned memory cells. Um, the effector cells are actually quite short-lived. So what they will do is, if it was a B lymphocyte, um, generate something called a plasma cell, who, which essentially is an antibody-producing factory. So that cell's job is to make lots of antibody and to clear the infection, but then those cells will die and they have to die, because if they didn't die, you would become one big lymph node <laughs> because of the number of infections that you encounter. So those cells will, will, will naturally die, but your body doesn't want to lose the knowledge of having had that exposure. So a subset of the cells don't become plasma cells, they become these memory cells, and these are the ones that circulate. And we don't really know what that mechanism is that causes that to happen, but your body does it. That's a very important question in terms of immunology, obviously. And would it be probably different in different people as well? Um, well, I mean, certainly what we know is that different, so, well, maybe different, different people, different situations, different diseases, or different vaccines. So the way that immunological memory develops does, it is different in different people. So some people don't respond to certain vaccines very well, whereas other people do. Um, and there's something, yes, about the nature of that antigen, about their response and so on to it. So there is a, a difference between that and different individuals. Um, and obviously immunological memory will depend on the amount of exposure you've got. So if there is an infectious agent in the environment, you might find that immunological memory is quite long-lived, but it's because you're getting destimulated. And we also know that there are cells that we have within our body, so a bit like that antigen-presenting cell that I told you, that hold on to antigen for quite a long time. And every time these lymphocytes are recirculating, they come in contact with it, and it's a bit like getting a stimulation, so that induces them, so they're getting a survival signal. So, and that isn't the same for all types of antigens and infections that you can encounter. Okay, thank you. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Um, we've obviously been hearing a, a lot recently about Ebola and this Ebola outbreak. And um, I, I listen to the, the news and so on and try and read about it. And sometimes I find that there's a, a, a bit of, sort of conflicting reporting. I hear some people talk about um, reporting that uh, the Ebola virus is not very infectious. Or, and then I see for myself a Scottish nurse who you know, is wearing all the protective clothing and, and ends up with the infection. I wonder if you could sort of explore that, the sort of seeming anomaly to me. Okay. Um, so first thing I would say is um, I'm not an Ebola expert. Um, my understanding of this process with this particular type of infection is that there is an incubation period, as you would have with almost every infection that you encounter. And that is essentially the period between you being exposed, being infected, and you're showing symptoms. And from my understanding of, of Ebola, um, what happens is that individuals get infected, there is this incubation period as the virus is multiplying in your body, but you're not showing symptoms. And at that stage, those individuals appear not to be particularly infectious. But at the later stages, when people show symptoms, and those symptoms are often obviously very severe, 
So there's vomiting, there's hemorrhaging, and there is those individuals have a lot of virus in their body fluids. Those body fluids are being excreted, and that's very, very infectious. And of course, the thing that we see with Ebola is that a lot of the cases um, are actually with health workers in the countries that are affected, so people trying to help people that are sick. And of course, when are the health workers coming in contact with them? At the later stages when, when they're, they're ill, very when they're very sick, and that's when they've got the highest virus load. So that's my understanding of why there seems to be this difference about how infectious it is, but it's that point of contact and coming in contact with infected body fluids at the very late stages or at death. And of course, within certain cultures, there's people will do things like touch bodies. That's what they, they do. It's a mark, a mark of respect when people die. And that would also be something that would transmit the infection very rapidly. So it's a sort of life cycle of the virus that makes this. OK, thanks. Um, I've also picked up um, on, on the news and so on that Ebola changes, is, is changing with time and that it's perhaps becoming less infectious. Um, is, is that right? Is that, is, that, is that the normal course of things? I mean, it's a very short, that's a very short time frame for this okay. to happen given the nature of the current outbreak. But infectious agents do adapt to their hosts. And if you think about it, it is not in the interests of an infectious agent to rapidly kill their host. Because if they kill their host and they can't get from that host to another one, That's then it. it's game over. <laughs> um, so actually, probably the most infectious agents, the, the most successful inf infectious agents are ones that become commensals. They end up living with you and not causing disease. Um, so, yes, I mean, there is adaptation. Viruses will adapt. They are notorious. And actually, bacteria will adapt because that's the process of antibiotic resistance. They're responding to, to treatments, and therefore they're genetically adapting. Um, and there's selective pressure for survival for those that can keep growing in the face of antibiotics. So infectious agents will, will do that, and they will adapt to, to the host. Um, and as I said, it is actually in the interest of the infectious agent um, not to kill the host rapidly. So this may be starting to happen with this particular Ebola virus? It, it, it could be starting to happen. Um, I mean, certainly there was a um, couple of press releases actually last year, um, towards it, it, in December, about um, reports on HIV changing. Now, but that has been in the human population now for actually quite a long time. Yes. Um, and it's different from Ebola because it affects people and it takes quite a long time before, before they see symptoms. So, um, but that virus um, does rapidly mutate. And again, there is some evidence that it is changing. With, with these um, cross-species in, infections, you know, we seem to be hearing a lot more about them, you know, bird flu, swine flu, SARS, and obviously Ebola. Is there some reason why these are so much, well, appear to be on the increase? So, um, I don't know if they're on the increase, um, given our, I think it's probably the way that we live our lives, modern lives. Um, we are not probably in as much contact with animals now as we might have been in the past, and also the things that we would have been worried about in the past, we've got a lot of vaccines for, so what happens is you start to see, you focus on other things, so, you know, smallpox being, you know, an example of something that was very, very nasty, people would have worried about 200 years ago, yeah. well, people don't worry about smallpox, they worry about something else, because they know that it's dangerous, so... So, I mean, but those, what we do know is that in monitoring disease outbreaks, so I think it's very easy to forget about the things that we'll get vaccines for. Um, and, you know, in developed countries, unfortunately, that is the case. In developing countries, there's still a lot of, particularly childhood deaths from preventable diseases. So things like diarrhea and respiratory diseases that in developed countries, we take it for granted that we can manage. Um, 
but those types of infections coming from animals, we are seeing more and more of them um, in developed. So, relative to what we can manage, right. okay. So, I think that's what it is. It's a relative thing, but of course, the big one that everyone's worried about would be pandemic flu, and you know the fact that keeping live livestock such as pigs and chickens together and viruses that can jump between between them and reassort and then you get a very infectious virus that could get into the human population and that is the big concern. And um, just just ending on, on a, a vaccination question, um, it's obviously a, a, a massive topic and it's a big topic in our human biology. Um, what was the sort of, can you talk at all about the sort of impact of, of people opting out of, say, the MMR vaccine? You know, what impact does that have on the individual and the, and the communities around them? So, as an immunologist, um, I advocate vaccination. Um, <laughs> so, um, I, and the evidence is very clearly there that good vaccines protect us against disease and it's a very effective way of disease management and promoting human health. Um, obviously there were concerns um, over, or public concerns over safety of yes. the MMR vaccine and one of the effects of that was that people elected not to vaccinate their children with that vaccine because of associations with autism. Um, and certainly um, the evidence was that after that situation when MMR vaccination was decreasing, the reported incidence of autism didn't decrease. So the association between autism and MMR was really not well founded at that point because we could see that the graphs were, were diverging. Um, so for all those reasons, MMR um, certainly the uptake was dropped and I think particularly again in developed countries people forgot that measles can kill it is a nasty infection um, and there have been now cases of measles outbreaks so there was um, one reported in the Swans area in 2012-2013 if people want to look this up then they can it's quite an interesting um, report because of the out, there was over a thousand um, children that were affected from the outbreak. Um, of those, um, almost none of them had had MMR, and the um, the figures and the, the estimates that came out of this were that if you had had one shot of MMR, you were ninety five percent the chance of you, you were ninety five percent ninety five out of hundred people would be protected um, against measles. And if you have two shots, it's 99 out of 100. So the vaccine does work. Um, and it was quite clear that in that case, it was individuals that had been vaccinated. Of course, then what you have is the situation of herd immunity breaking down. So once the infectious agent gets into a population, if people are not vaccinated or not immune, it spreads rapidly through that population. And that sort of data, Gary, would, would that be available to teachers? Um, so, I mean, students? if you, yeah, I mean, if you Googled it, so it was, um, you would, you, it, Swansea, it was an outbreak in Swansea in 2012-13, so you would find that on the web. Yeah, and that might provide some quite nice data. Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting data in terms of um, how, how good a vaccine MMR actually okay. is. Well, thanks very much, Gary. Um, and I think I think we're now going to pass over to some questions from our audience. Oh, okay. Um, we've got a couple of questions um, have come in um, for Gary. Well, uh, one of them, I guess, is just a general question that we can answer very quickly. Um, Leanne Russell is wondering if um, the teachers are going to get copies of Gary's slides and the answer to that is yes, there'll be a download pod will appear at the end of our broadcast here and you'll be able to download the slides immediately or we will be putting a recording and the resources on the on the CERT website and you'll be able to access them there. Um, Gary, Janie Irving from Elgin High School has um, uh, sent in a question on the on the chat pod and I'll just read what, what Janie said. She says, during uh, clonal selection theory, so I'm assuming maybe when she was 
teaching this with her class or talking to her class about it. Pupils queried self-tolerance linked to autoimmune disease. Is there any way to simply explain these complex conditions? Okay, um, I will try. Um, so we have, in effect, two different types of tolerance. Um, we have what's called central tolerance and we have peripheral tolerance. So central tolerance operates under that model that I showed you for the clonal selection theory, um, where the antigen has to be present at the early stage of T-cell development. So that would be, for example, where T-cells are developing the thymus, that that antigen is present. Now, what we do know is that antigens that might be in tissues that are those T-cells don't come in contact with, um, an example for that could be antigens on beta cells, islet cells in the pancreas. So in that case, um, you wouldn't necessarily delete those T cells. But what happens is that as they um, circulate and they're undergoing immune or you, they're circulating around the body, those cells undergo what's called peripheral tolerance. So they're educated not to respond um, under normal circumstances to those antigens. So that's why we don't get autoimmunity, is that essentially those cells ignore your own antigens. So they're not deleted, um, but they ignore them. And then if something goes wrong, you can get autoimmunity. Because if the clonal selection model was absolute, you would never see autoimmunity. And I think maybe that's where the clever school kids were <laughs> recognizing that there is a potential flaw in that model. Okay, thank you, Gary. Um, there aren't any other questions on the chat pod at the moment, but there's still time for people to um, pose some questions if they wish to do that. But in the meantime, um, if you don't mind, I've got a question, um, which is, can you talk a wee bit about what is the relationship between an individual's susceptibility to cancer and immunity? Um, I mean, obviously, cancer arises in... Uh, and different types of cancer arise in different people at different points in their their life. Where you do see an increase in cancer generally is as people get older. So um, again, what we've done in developed countries is we've managed our health quite well. We are much better at protecting ourselves against infectious diseases. We live longer, um, but our immune systems, we know, um, do age. And there's a lot of interest from immunological researchers at the moment in trying to understand those processes and trying to keep the immune system active in later life. So effectively, this is, this is about immune surveillance. And it's about the, the immune system actually not being able to um, detect and eliminate those tumour cells. So what happens is the incidence increases as we get older. Um, obviously, um, the, we don't understand all the processes of cancer. There's many different types. And there will be environmental factors as well as um, genetic factors. So, for example, we know, um, I think it's been in the news quite a lot, actually, over the last week or so, depending on what items you read in the news. Um, or what you Google, but um, Angelina Jolie and um, her discussions about whether or not she should have surgery because she's um, at risk of breast cancer. Um, so um, there are genetic factors that come into play and there's also environmental factors. So depending on what you've been exposed to, we know that there are certain chemicals, um, there are um, radioisotopes and so on that can, and um, exposure to radioactivity that can um, result in um, cancer. So there's a, there's a lot of um, a lot of things go on there, but yes, there, there is obviously individual um, variation in that. Okay, thank you, Gary. So I don't see any other questions on the um, chat pod. So um, I think um, we will um, draw our certain to a close now, um, and I will do so by thanking Gary for his lecture, which I'm sure the teachers will have found. Um, 
great interest and great value. Um, and I would also like to thank Sean and Gary for coming here and giving of their time and expertise this afternoon. And you know, for the time that you spent with us in preparation and so on for this. We're very grateful. So thank you very much.